Today I want to talk to you about the power, the practical power, the powerful practice of kingdom communities and what it looks like to be in community and why it's so important and how you can express that in a really, really practical way. So um, fasten your seatbelt. Go ahead, just fasten your seatbelt really quickly. No, I'm just kidding. Just unbuckle it because you may want to jump up and down. So don't, don't fasten it. But I'm going to share some things. Some of this will remind you of things you already know. Some of it will sort of refresh. Oh, yeah, I forgot that. And other things I'm hoping will be revelatory, that they'll impart new revelation because have you know that we've always got room to learn. There's always new things God wants to give us and teach us. And so let's believe for all of that, refreshing on what we know and revelation on what we don't. Amen? I want to share several things with you, uh, but I, I tend to operate in groups of threes, not all the time. Sometimes it's twos, fours, fives, but I have three things about, the king, about kingdom community I want to share with you today, and then within each of those three things, I have three more things. So it's going to get all threed up here in a minute, and then, and then and on top of all that, it may drive you crazy, but I tend to alliterate, so I like to start with the same letter of each word when I can, and God tends to speak to me that way, so please know this isn't just for effect, it's actually how I think. Uh, I'm not doing it to be cute, I actually think this way, so it's, it's just who I am. You know, I, I, I remember a guy named Dick Mills, that he just thought in Bible verses. Like if you talked to him about, if you asked him any question, he would answer with a Bible verse, because he only thought, he had almost the whole Bible memorized, so if you asked him a question, he would answer with a verse. And he wasn't trying to be religious, he just knew the word of God so well, that was his language. So he, he spoke in the language of scripture. And so each of us have those propensities and those sort of uh, orientations that God gives us, amen? Super awesome. Okay, well, that's mine. So the first thing I want to say about kingdom community, and what I mean by kingdom community is I mean a group of people that live in the kingdom together. They dwell in kingdom together, all right? And the first thing about kingdom community is that it's satisfying. It is very, very satisfying to live in kingdom community. And I want to tell you quickly why. God made us in his image, and God lives in community. How many of you know that God has never, ever known what it's like to be lonely or alone? Why? He is one God, but that God exists in three manifested persons or personalities. I don't know exactly how it works, except that I am a son of my parents, I'm a husband to my wife, and I'm a father to my children. And those roles are different even though I'm one person. And I believe in the same way God manifests or reveals himself in three different uh, expressions of who he is. And so if you can understand it this way, I think the book, The Shack, demonstrates it best, honestly. I'm not getting into Paul Young's theology right now. I'm just telling you that when he describes the Trinity and the affection between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it just, it just lights my fire because I'm like, that is how I see God. So honoring Father, honoring the Son, the Son honoring the Father, the Holy Spirit honoring Father. So, there's so much honor and so much unity and so much togetherness, and yet distinct personality that I'm just like, how did you do, who, I mean, God, but from all eternity, he's existed as the triune God, the three-in-one God. And so God himself has never known loneliness. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's only known community. So think about this. He created you and I in his image, so how do you think we were created? We were created for community. God never intended for us to be alone. You know how we know that? From creation. Everything he made was perfect till he saw that Adam was alone. He said, this isn't good. This doesn't reflect my image. This isn't how I made, this isn't how I'm going to make humanity. He needs somebody with him because he's not meant to be alone. It's not good for people to be alone. And again, I'm not talking about personality. We all have different personalities. Some of you are extroverts. Some of you are introverts. There's no condemnation for introverts. If you like to be alone, that's okay. That's not, we're not talking about personality right now. Like my wife is a, is a high extrovert, so most of the time she gets replenished by being with people. I'm sort of 60-40 extrovert introvert, so I get replenished most of the time by not being with people. It doesn't mean I don't like people, it just means I'm with people a lot, and when I wanna replenish, I like, to, I like to do what I call putter. So puttering is doing nothing with no schedule and no one telling me that I, I'm not doing it right. I, like, I, I have plenty of people looking at my life all the time, and I'm not talking about sin, I'm just talking about puttering, like just wasting time as it were, but, you know, wasting time on Jesus, wasting time in the presence of God, wasting time shopping, wasting time driving around, wasting time going on walks, if you will. But it's, it's something that I enjoy so much, and it refuels my soul. So we get replenished differently, and that's okay. That's a personality thing. So I'm not talking about personality. What I'm talking about is actually the way you're designed by God. 
You and I are designed, whether you're introverted or extroverted, you're designed by God to dwell in community. Now, the hard part about community is that it's messy. It's messy because people do people stuff. And if everybody was perfect, community would be perfect, but it's so not because there's so much brokenness in us. And so it's like a broken person trying to hang out with a broken person can produce more brokenness actually. So that's why that book, you know, Hurt People, Hurt People came out because it's just true. That doesn't mean God's design is wrong. It means we need to get healed. We need to get healed, but we need to still press into the reality of community. And what I'm saying to you is that when we do it God's way, we are entering into God's design and God's plan, and it becomes deeply satisfying. I want to read you sort of a scriptural reality here, okay? It's, I'm going to put it up on the screen, but this is several scriptures combined. It's not good when people are always alone, and the person who continually isolates is selfish. That's straight from scripture. That's Proverbs 18.1. In reality, two are always better than one, and a threefold cord is hard to defeat. God places individuals into community so that we can learn to love one another and become one, just like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that's an extrapolated paragraph from those one, two, three, four, five passages of Scripture. Uh, that's just straight scriptural truth. So, so I just want you to absorb that for a second. What an amazing reality that God has called us into the satisfying reality of community. And again, enjoy your alone time. Don't be condemned. Beautiful. But don't live like that. Don't live by yourself because it actually makes you a little bit weird. It does. It makes you weird. You know why? Because the Bible says the one who isolates himself or isolates herself is selfish. You, you, it's, the, the phrase in the New American Standard is seeks his own desire. I mean, you become about you. The more you're into you, the more you become absorbed with you. You got to get out of your own head space. That's why you need other people. Now, uh, again, this is not, this is all for free. This isn't in my notes, but I just want to share with you that all of us, not all of us, 95 to 97% of us were raised in dysfunctional families. It's, right, it's about the right statistic. And a dysfunctional family means imperfect, basically. So the other 5 to 3% are lying. No, I'm just kidding. No, but there, there are some healthy, functional families out there, but there aren't very many. And that doesn't mean that ours was so bad. Some of you had awful families. Some of you didn't even have a family. It was just grandma, brokenness, uh, foster care, whatever. But those of us who were raised in a natural family, it still wasn't perfect. And because of that, certain aspects of our, of our, of our, th our thought process and our emotions were shaped by an imperfect family. And so we don't actually know what normal is. So what happens is you grow up and you look in the mirror of family and it looks back at you and it says, this is normal. So normal might be blowing up every time someone criticizes you. Now, that's not normal in the kingdom, but that is normal in family. You know, um, family might be uh, degrading women and lusting after them and, and seeing them as objects rather than as human beings that have value. That's not normal in the kingdom, but that can be normal in your family, right? So what happens is people are raised in that dysfunctional environment, and they think that's what normal is. But then you become a Christian, and you're like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm acting in ways that aren't according to the Bible. But I don't know what normal is because I never had a model of it. That's what community provides. Community provides the safety. You ever gone bowling? How many of you are good bowlers? Okay, we're ignoring you for just a minute. All the bad bowlers. How many of you appreciate bumper lanes? You can't lose with bumper lanes, right? It's like you're always going to hit at least one pin, which is so awesome. So I'm a winner with bumper lanes. But the thing about bumper lanes is, is that is community. See, what happens is you go through life, and how many of you like rolling gutter balls? Nobody likes it. It feels bad. You're like, I'm a loser. I can't bowl. But when you have bumper lanes, you're always going to hit something. And so what happens is we don't know what normal is, but then community comes around us, and it provides those bumper lanes. And it's like we start hitting the mark. We start, we start realizing, you know what, that reaction I have is not normal because I've been hurting people for the last five years and I want to change. And the community helps us know what normal is. That's why, that's why the Bible says confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. It doesn't say forgiven because you can get forgiven by God alone, but you get healed in community. See, you become transformed by having the bumper lanes of community to show you, hey, that's a little bit out of bounds there, or that's a little weird, or that's a little this, or that's a little that. And, and that feedback helps you go, wow, I don't want to be like, I want to be like this. 
And I know it's hard for some of us. Some of us are very touchy. We have thin skin. That's just a sign that you were raised in a dysfunctional family and you haven't been healed yet. Because actually what happens, the longer you're with Jesus, the more you learn how to love and not have thin skin. You become thick. You become strong. You can handle stuff. You don't get freaked out when people are, you know, uh, challenge you. You're like, you can handle it. You, you don't, your, your blood pressure doesn't go up. But if your blood pressure is still going up, you're not mature yet. That doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means you need more community. Why? I'll tell you why. Because you can do a lot of things in Christianity by yourself, but you can't grow your character by yourself. You can't. It's impossible because character is grown in community. I'll tell you why. Because you have no feedback when you're by yourself. You can read all the books you want on character. You can read books about prayer. You can spend hours and hours a day by yourself with God alone. But the problem is, is if you don't walk in community, you never know if your theories are actually true. You can build all kinds of theories about how amazing you are in your head, but let other people tell you how amazing you are, and then you'll know for sure if you're amazing or not. Why? Because it has to work in the real world. Otherwise, you're just a theorist, and that's no good. So, so what happens in community is that we get satisfied. We become who we were meant to become. And it's the most beautiful thing. I'm going to give you three ways we get satisfied. The first one is companionship. That's why it says two are better than one. Why? Because it's better to walk through life with others than all by yourself. That doesn't mean at times, you know, you have to walk alone. And that's all true. But it's better overall to be with others, to do life with others. It's lonely to do it by yourself. I mean, there's no one to celebrate with. There's no, companionship is from God. And then there's connection. You know, I've, I've shared with you that Cheryl and I have went to marriage counseling about two or three years ago. Uh, we weren't in crisis, but we just, we were, we were communicating well, but we weren't always connecting. You know how sometimes you can talk but not connect? Like you miss each other. It was mostly me, actually, but whatever. Uh, we'll say it was 50-50 for now. But most problems in our marriage are my fault, actually. I'm, a, I'm pretty aware of that. Anyway, I married an almost perfect person. So, so, but what I found out, I found out that, and I didn't believe this at first. When we started counseling, my counselor said that what everybody wants deep down is connection. And I thought, eh, I don't know if I agree with that. Because I'm, I tend to, I'm Mike, on the, on the uh, Enneagram, I'm a reformer. I don't take anybody's opinion for anything. I research it. I decide if it's true or not, whatever. That's just me. I'm not trying to be rebellious. I just do. But once I verify it, I'm all in. Because I'm a reformer. I like to see things transform from glory to glory. Amen? So, but I started meditating on this. I read some books on it. I prayed about it. And I thought, you know what? This is true. Everybody deep down wants to connect. And I've, 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 I've been saying this phrase for some years now, everybody wants the same thing. Everybody wants to know others and be known themselves. You ever been in a crowd but felt completely alone? Do you know why that exists? It exists because you're in the proximity of people that don't know you. You see, if everybody on the train knew you, you'd feel so in community. But you're on a train, you're looking at all these faces and there's all this potential for connection but there's no connection. And if you try to reach out and do connection, it feel everybody would frown at you and say you're a weirdo because you're like, don't talk to me, I'm on the train or I'm in the elevator, right? But everybody wants to know and to be known. Everybody wants to love and to be loved. Everybody wants to serve and to be served. We all want the same thing and that's called connection. Everybody wants it. You can say you don't want it, I don't believe you. I think you're actually so wounded or so angry that you won't admit what you want. Because everybody was made by God in his image for connection. Connection is the point of life. Did you guys know that the reason the Lord wants to save people is to connect with them? He's not trying to save them to get them in his camp or to put a stamp on them or to be in power. He wants to save them to connect with them. And what happens is that sin disconnects us from God. Jesus came to save his people from their sins so they wouldn't live in sin, they could live in connection because sin produces brokenness and brokenness is the opposite of connection. So you see, when we are satisfied in community, we're satisfied by companionship and connection and honestly, contentment. You see, we, we were created for connection so when we have it, we feel content. There's a lot of things I want in life. But when I'm connected to God and I'm connected to my wife and I'm connected to my kids and I'm connected to you, 
I feel content. I have a thousand other things I want to get done in life, but none of them drives me. None of them makes me upset. I don't need any of them to happen. I may want certain things because I'm a visionary and I'm a dreamer, but I don't need them. I've got connection and I'm good. So what happens is when you're in community, you are connected and you are content. And if you're living in the family, but you're not in the family, you're discontent. You're always frustrated. You're always reaching out for something. You're always trying to do something. You're always, you have wanderlust. You're always trying to go travel, do something, make something happen, go to a conference, get excited because you're not connected. You're living in the midst of community, but you're not in community. You're not being real with anyone, and no one's being real with you. We were created for connection, and it satisfies. We're created for community, and it heals our hearts. Does that make sense? All right, let me keep going. Kingdom community isn't just satisfying. It's also very, very spiritual. Like, if you want to become spiritual, if you want to become a mature spiritual person, community does things that you can't do by yourself. I already said that. I used to have a poster in my room that said, uh, it said, uh, talent is produced in solitude, character in the stream of life. So you can become a talented Christian by yourself, but you can't have character without other people. You become like Jesus in this messy thing called family. You can't become like Jesus all by yourself. You can become talented. You can quote scripture. You can pray. You can dance. You can sing. But that's just talent. That's not character. Character is what happens to you when somebody gets in your face. That's who you actually are. How do you react? Character happens when you fail. How do you react? Do you live in shame for the next year? Or do you get up, dust yourself off, receive the grace of God, and move on? That's who you actually are. Character is what you do when no one's looking. That's who you are. Right? And so what community does is it enhances, it grows our spirituality. Because first of all, community guards us. It protects us. That's why in Ecclesiastes 4, it says two are better than one because they can stand back to back. We talked about this a week or two ago. That when you're in community, you can stand back to back. You, you can cover each other. It says, woe to the person that falls down and there's no one to help them up. It's like, we're not meant to do this life alone. We're meant to do it in community so that we're protected. You know, when you're under attack, you have to have five to 10 people on speed dial that you can call, that, that will call you. And if you don't, you're living alone. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means that's not good enough. That's not a good enough life. You gotta have those people that are got your back and you've got their back. And see, here's the challenge with church. This is one hour a week. I mean, really, aside from the worship, the, the message is less than, it's like 30 to 40 minutes, really. So, I mean, with ministry and everything, it's not even an hour, but it's an hour a week that we sit in rows. But the hour doesn't define us at all. Like, there's 167 other hours in the week where we get a chance to practice what we're preaching. We get a chance to l live out, and we have to do that in community. So if all we're doing is spending an hour a week in a church building, that's not very good. Like that's kind of, we're just reinforcing the old stereotype that church people are disconnected and hypocritical, but they just go to church. Like, let's not do that. Let's live in community so that we can walk this thing out together and not be lonely. There's a couple of amens there. It's exciting. All right. Kingdom of community is spiritual because it guards us, but it also guides us. I talked a minute ago about the, the bumper rails. See, what happens when you live in community? See, when you're by yourself, here's the challenge when you do all your spirituality in your head. You can come up with all kinds of wild theories about what God's saying. You can even get way out of away from Scripture. You can, you can come up with your own theories. God told me this. God told me that. But when you're in community, the community roots you in the truth. You actually get guided by community. Did you know that in Ephesians, it talks about um, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. It says don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do you know that that's written to a church, not to an individual? In other words, there are things that we discover in community that you can't discover by yourself. I'll give you an example. How many of you know that Ephesians 3, Paul's prayer for the church at Ephesus where he says, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father, verse 14, from whom heaven and earth derives its name, I love this prayer. And he gets to the end, and he says, I want you to understand together with all the saints what is the height and the breadth and the width and the love of God. In other words, there's a dimension of the love of God you cannot discover without the saints. 
You can't discover the love of God and all of its heights and all of its depths on your own because you read three books and prayed 40 hours. It does not work that way. I wish it did because I've done all those things. <laughs> and if it would have worked, it would have happened already. But it's a, I, I gotta tell you a quick story. I think I've shared this a couple times. So I was a lifeguard at Hume Lake. I did lifeguard with YMCA, Hume Lake, Forest Home. That was sort of my gig, I loved to swim. And so when I was 19, I was a lifeguard at Hume Lake, California, up in the Sierra Sequoias. And, and uh, I didn't like my, my supervisor very much. He, wasn't, he didn't feel to me like a very nice guy. And occasionally, I'd, I'd, you know, he would irritate me, or, which is normal. I mean, that's not, that's not bad. But I remember this one day. I was having my devotions, and the, the, the devotions where I'm with Jesus, you know, where you don't interrupt people when they're having their devotions. <laughs> and my boss said to me in sort of a gruff voice, hey, Mark, go clean out that uh, guard shack. And I snapped at him, which you can't do. And <laughs> you cannot do that, or you go to the boss's office. So I snapped at him, and so I ended up at the boss's office. This guy's name was Ken Poor. He was, the, he was over the whole camp. And uh, as I'm getting ready to go to the boss's office and defend myself that, that this guy interrupted my, which I was on my own time. I was technically right, by the way. I was on my own time. I wasn't, he didn't have the right to interrupt my devotions to tell me to go clean the guard shack, except that he was my boss, but still, I was on my own time. But as I was making my way to the boss's office, the, the supervisor the guy who was you know, gonna determine our case, I began to think about the scripture I was reading during my, my devotions, and it was 1 John 4, which says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and he who does not love does not know God. So here I was reading a scripture about how to love other people, but I couldn't make it work in real life when I was bothered, just a little bit. And I realized, I had no clue what that passage was about because it wasn't inside of me yet. I had memorized it. I could tell you what it meant theologically, but I didn't know how to practice it. It was an amazing lesson. Of course, I was very humble when I got into the supervisor's office, not just because I was in the wrong and it was my position, but because God had convicted me. That's just an illustration of what we all do, right? That sometimes we think we're all that and a bag of chips and really your test is how you react to your spouse, your children, your parents, your friends, when life isn't easy. And that's what comes out of you is you. And if you think it's something different, you're wrong. That's all a facade. And it doesn't mean you're a bad person, it just means you yeah, gotta grow. It doesn't mean you're bad, it just means, hey, let's grow. Now, if you're trying to grow all by yourself, it's not gonna work. You gotta grow in community. And by the way, you can't just grow with your spouse. You know what it, pressure it puts on your spouse when you just try to isolate from everybody else and just do it with your spouse? You try to make your spouse into the Lord. They gotta be, provide everything for you. Why? Because you don't have any friends, you don't have any people in your life, you won't let anyone speak in, you're just trying to get it all from your spouse, and your spouse is going, please let me breathe, <laughs> you're killing me. Because you're putting it all on your spouse to provide everything that only Jesus can provide, first of all, and secondly, everything that's meant to be provided in community. That's why we need the church. That's why we need each other. You can't just do it, you and Jesus and your spouse. It doesn't work. It may work short term, but it won't work long term. And lastly, in terms of spiritual benefits of being in community is that community imparts grace to us. You guys know that the word for grace in Greek is charis, right? C-H-R-I-S. Did you know the word for gifts is also charis? It's the same exact Greek word. Now here's what Romans 12 says. It says, to each of us has been given a measure of charis. In other words, you have uh, 0.7 nanograms of charis and I have 0.6 nanograms of, I don't know what the measurement is, but God has given you a measure of grace. You, everybody starts the Christian life with a certain amount of grace. Now, the thing about it is, is that he who humbles himself gets more grace. The Bible says he gives a greater grace. So you can increase in your grace. Everybody gets a measure, everybody can grow. How do you grow? You humble yourself. If you, if you resist, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So you get more grace the more you humble yourself. 
which is counterintuitive because in the world you stand up for yourself and you fight and you put up your boundaries. There's a certain case for that. But if all you're about is your boundaries, you're missing grace. Yeah, you're insisting on your rights, but you're not getting any grace. So you're just, you're grace deficient, which is why you judge others so harshly because you don't have any grace for them or yourself. Judgmental people lack grace because God's resisting them. But when you're in community, you get grace. Why? Because the same grace that we call grace is also gifts. And so, Mark, if I operate in my gift and you operate in your gift, we impart grace to one another. That's what the gifts do. The gifts impart grace. You see, the prophetic ministry we're going to do after the service that David's leading, that's going to impart grace to the people that listen because true prophecy imparts grace to people. Anointed preaching imparts grace to people. Our gifts, when used properly, impart grace. And the problem is is that some of us are not using our gifts very much. We're just doing life. But the problem is is that you slowly die if all you do is just do life. You pay the bills and you go to the store. That's not what life's about. Life is about the exchange of grace. We receive grace from God and we give grace to others. How many of you know that life isn't about getting grace from others? It's about giving grace to others, receiving it from God. If we're all doing the same thing, everyone's getting an overload of grace. Why? Because Romans 5.17 says the person who reigns in life is the one that receives the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness. See, if we receive God's abundant grace, we have something to give during the day. We have something to give when we confront people that are less than ideal because we're filled with grace. I had a situation recently where somebody made a rough decision that really negatively affected me and I wanted to... I wanted to put them in their place because I'm a human being and I've got fleshly temptations that come up. But I didn't give in. I didn't give in. I just said, no, even though I want to, I'm admitting I wanted to. That's called temptation. How many know temptation is not sin? I wanted to impart law. I wanted to impart justice. But I felt like John Arnott taught me years ago, there's a grace level and there's a justice level. So can I borrow you for just one second, Todd? Yeah. So let's say that Todd, come, come up here, Todd, just come up here, and please don't hit me for, sh- for actual, but just throw a punch to about right there. Okay, so Todd just hurt me. Okay, now go back to your seat, thank you. <laughs> now I've got a decision right now. My decision is to go pay Todd back. That would be, it would be a tough fight because he's bigger than me, but I'd, I'd go for it because I'm a gamer. And I have some boxing and Kenpo karate background, so I might do okay. Anyway, so here's the challenge. The challenge is I'm on a grace level right now. If I leave that grace level, I'm going to go down to a justice level, and I'm going to go like that. So I'm going to pay him back what he just did to me. But I left grace to do it. See? So if I stay up here, I don't leave the grace level. I don't have to pay him back. I pray. I reach out. I invite, but I'm not going down to the justice level. I'm going to stay in grace, and I win. Not against him. I win against the temptation to be a lesser version of myself. Does that make sense? So kingdom community is very spiritual, and we practice it in community. When he does that to me, that's my opportunity to see if I have any grace. Because I never know how much grace I have till that happens. Is that not true? You can theorize about how much grace you have, but you don't know until that happens. Then you find out how much grace. When you start reacting differently over time to your husband, your wife, when they say something you don't like, your grace is growing. If you're doing the same thing you've been doing for years, your grace hasn't grown no matter what you say, no matter how many conferences you go to. It doesn't matter. It's got to be tested. Even the Lord says, I'm going to let them first be tested and then let them serve as deacons, right? There has to be a test. God doesn't set you up for tests to fail you. He sets you up for tests to pass you. But you have to cooperate. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? Can you give me a few more minutes? Let's just make this last point, okay? Kingdom community is satisfying, it's spiritual, and it's strategic. And I want you to really see this, okay? It is so God's plan. God's plan is community. From Old Testament to New Testament, it's never changed. It's always been community. He administrates that differently in the New Testament because of Jesus. 
But in the Old Testament, it was always about community. He picked a people. The Bible says he almost picked them randomly. Israel was a random pick. They weren't better than anybody else. They weren't more godly than anybody else. They, he just picked a godly man named Abraham, and he said, hey, I'm going to make a nation out of you. And here's the goal. I'm going to so love on the nation that comes from your loins that everyone else is going to get jealous. And when they come, I'm going to love on them the same way. In other words, Israel was always meant to be special, but everyone else was meant to receive the same love. So yes, there are promises for Israel. I honor that. But everybody was supposed to get the same love. Whether they were born into the family or adopted into the family, they all got the same love. Or grafted in. Right? So it's always been God's plan. Now, I want to just show you in a couple of ways. First of all, Emmanuel. The word Emmanuel, what does Emmanuel mean? How did Jesus demonstrate that he was with us? Besides, he was, we know he was born in a manger, but what did he do to be among us? Like, how did he demonstrate that? Because if you say his itinerant ministry, you'd be partially correct, only that really wasn't how he did community. So yes, he would travel from city to city and he would preach the gospel, he would multiply bread, he'd do miracles, he would heal the sick, but how many of you know that that ministry had stops and starts? In John 6, he had thousands following him and he started talking about communion and people, it, the Bible says everybody left except for his 12 disciples. So he was, honey, I shrunk the church. Like his, his itinerant ministry went from thousands to zero. It did. He wasn't that, he wasn't that effective at all the time. If you're gonna have a crowd all the time, you're gonna have to man please. You cannot have a crowd all the time and tell the truth. Because there's a lot of people that don't want to hear the truth, so you're going to lose people when you tell the truth. So in John 6, you see Jesus telling the truth, and he lost a ton of people, but he didn't get upset about it. He just said, hey, are you guys leaving too? And they said, Peter, Peter's amazing, and also had his foot in his mouth, but he was still amazing. And he said, where else are we going to go? You alone have the words of eternal life. We're not going anywhere. we got nowhere to go. You've boxed us in. You've ruined us. We're ruined. But what was Emmanuel's plan to change the world? What was God with us plan? It was to take 12 guys and live with them for three and a half years until they became who he was. That was his entire plan. Yes, he did do some stuff through preaching and ministering. That, but, but the people who get hooked up on that are people that aren't very relational. Honestly, you wear a non-relational lens and you can try to do it through conferences and meetings. But, but if you're a relational person, which we all are, Jesus did it through 12 he really, his whole strategy was to take 12 guys and shape them and form them into his followers so that when he left the earth, they would keep going. And that's exactly what happened. Exactly. He taught them, he corrected them, he helped them, he hung out with them, he modeled for them, he sent them, he gave them feedback. He did the whole thing and he did it right. And at the end of three and a half years, they got it, or at least mostly got it. And then it, in John chapter 21, it says he breathed into them and they became born again but they still weren't anointed. So he said, I want you to wait in Jerusalem. And do you remember how many people hung out with the 12? Actually, it was 11 because Judas killed himself. So he had 11 and then Matthias. So he had 12. There were 120. So really, he invested in a seed of 10%. And, and by the time his ministry was done, after three and a half years, he had, a, he had less people than are in this church. But that group of people changed the world. His strategy worked. Why? Because they knew how to do community. They were close they got filled with the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden, the community went from 120 to 3,000. The Bible says that, or, or scholars say that the Jerusalem church, before Acts chapter 8 and the dispersion and the persecution, the Jerusalem church was probably 30 to 50,000 people. So that means it went from 120 to 3,000 to 30,000 plus, pretty quickly, actually. It just blew up. And you know what the strategy of the early church was? It was exactly the same as Jesus's. They met house to house and in the temple courts. They did open air preaching, but they met in homes and in groups. They met in groups over and over. And the Bible actually says they did it every single day. Every single day, people's homes were open and then they met at the temple courts for the, for the message, you know, where they listened and one person talked. They did that thing too, but they met in homes. Look at Acts 5, uh, 246 and 542. That was the strategy. They just did exactly what Jesus did. Jesus started a small group and he did some open air preaching. They started small groups and they did open air preaching. Exactly the same. And by the way, if you're a house of prayer person, you're like, where does house of prayer fit in? Let me tell you, 
Read the book of Acts and see what happened in prayer meetings. They always became apostolic and went to the streets. Every single time they went to a prayer meeting, it blew up and it caused evangelism. There was no such thing as a monastic house of prayer in the book of Acts. No such thing. It was only an apostolic house of prayer. Starting with Acts chapter 2, they met to pray, blew up, 3,000 got saved. Peter started preaching right out of the house of prayer. They, came, they were upstairs, the fire of God fell, and they went and they evangelized. Acts chapter 3, they're going to the temple to pray. There's a lame man there. He gets healed. A crowd gathers. They get put in jail. The church prays them back, and they preach the gospel. Blows up. It just happens over and over. Acts chapter 12, Lydia, she gets saved. They get, it, blow, it just keeps going on and on and on. It's always apostolic. Is anybody hearing this? Jesus' plan was strategic. It was always groups plus open-air preaching. The early church's plan was strategic, groups plus open-air preaching, always. Now, when I say open-air, I, I mean, a lot of it was in a, like, the temple was actually an indoor-outdoor building. It had a roof, had a covering, and it had Solomon's colonnade was, had all kinds of arches and columns. So they had uh, walls on two sides, a roof and a wall, and then they had no walls on the other side. So it was half indoors, half outdoors, if you will. So it's the indoor-outdoor building. Be a lot like some of our restaurants that have openings, you know, and that's kind of that's where they did the open-air preaching. Other times, like in the school of Tyrannus, where Paul taught for two year, three years, it was a complete building, completely indoors. Their training, their tra a lot of their training schools were actually in buildings. So this whole idea that the church is never going to have a building, that's crazy. That's not how the early church operated at all. It's just we can't become enamored with the building. We can't let the building define us. Like the, the hour we meet here or a few other hours a week cannot define us. Like we gotta learn to live in community. And this doesn't stop it or start it. This just just a setting, just like Jesus, just like the early church. Are we making sense yet? Yeah. All right, so that's Emmanuel's plan and the early church's plan. What about every day's plan? That's the 30. E. Come on now, get excited you people. Show me some teeth. Let me just show you what we're doing right now, okay? Let's go to that next chart. So we started out at Everyday with just one kind of group called microchurches. The reason we did that is we were starting a church. And microchurches are really good apostolic vehicles to start churches or to start works. So they're perfect for pioneering in a place or with a new people. Cheryl and I started a, a microchurch in Guadalupe because there's no everyday presence in Guadalupe. Right? Rich has started a microchurch in San Luis Obispo because we're trying to plant a church there. But microchurches, we practiced it for years and years because we wanted to get the model down, but it's not the only model of a group, right? But if you look across, the, hit the next slide, the goals and the gifts. So the goal of a microchurch is to pioneer in, with a group of people or in a new place. It requires primarily an apostolic gift. And it's got alternating formats. And the reason we do that is one, a model after Acts chapter 2 when the early church pioneered then Bible intercession worship, dinner body life groups, we have that alternating format because it creates a balanced diet for people. But there's a lot of different, the Lord's been speaking to us for several years to start different kinds of groups, so we are. So here's some more that we're starting, which is so exciting. Journey groups, go ahead and hit that one. They're all about connecting, all about caring for one another and growing in our character to be like Jesus. They require more of a pastoral gift to lead it. And they're about honest, intimate sharing, and they're actually closed, meaning they're not on the church bulletin. They're open by invitation only because we don't want to have a bunch of people show up or we're going to lose the intimacy that we have. So they're, they're people deciding to do a journey together. They're going to walk their Christian out to get Christianity out together, which is awesome, totally different than a microchurch, which is open, trying to grow and establish a work. A journey group is closed, and it's all about people doing life and ministry together, usually same gender or couples, but still, it's awesome. And then we've got passion groups, which are really about the fun and the feeling of fun and fellowship. They're about a good vibe. And um, they're really for the evangelist, really. They're perfect for reaching out. They're all about hospitality. They're about welcoming, bringing people in. Of course, they're open because you want more and more people to come, uh, about enjoying one another. And uh, so I like to use uh, Winter as my example because she started, she saw this. And Winter's very, she's very, uh, she's got an evangelistic heart and I think gifting. And so she said, what could I do? Little old me, what could I do that would help bring the kingdom? And she said, I know, I'll do a dog walking group. Now that doesn't sound nearly as spiritual as a micro church, ooh, <laughs> micro church. But I love that she's doing a dog walking group. Why? Because she got a hold of some people that were like her, had a similar interest, similar passion. 
and turn it into this thing. And she's trying to explore it and figure it out and I haven't given her much coaching, so we will. But I'm so proud of you for even trying. Like you're just trying, like how cool that she's trying. Give her a hand for just trying. And then you got learning groups, which are about educating, equipping, and empowering. The teacher gift is perfect for that. And it's about preparing people to win at life and win at ministry. Like it's, it's, equi- it's getting people ready to go. You know, it's about educating. And, and um, man, we got some great teachers in here that have been a little stifled because we only had one model, which was microchurches. But now we've got learning groups, which are awesome. This is fun, isn't it? Aren't you guys excited? And then we've got serving groups, which are about missioneering, if you will. It's about meeting to minister. And the, prof- the prophetic gift is perfect because prophets see They want to see God on the earth. They see the potential. You think, well, prophets don't serve very well. Yes, they do. When they see vision, they serve like crazy. Actually, prophets are among the most servant-hearted people because they so want people to get it. They want people to get God. They want people to encounter God. And so they're perfect for doing, uh, being a team that serves towards destiny. You know, Jeff, who was, o- who was over the house of prayers, over at Voices House of Prayer, who's a, really a prophet in many ways, what did he do? He started, a, he had a Tuesday night prayer meeting and he decided to do a Tuesday night, he called it a microchurch because we didn't have all these names back then, but he started a group of people that served together. So the people that served in the house of prayer for the prayer meeting were in the group together. Isn't that cool? He only had to be out one night a week and he could have a group and a ministry. So that's what's so cool about this. You don't have to do like two nights a week or anything. You just do that. Do that for an hour, hour and 15 minutes, hour and 30 minutes, and then do the ministry for an hour, and and you're done. And you've done everything. You've ministered together. You've met together. You've become family together. How do you know that the people who serve together become closest? It's one thing to stare at each other's eyes. You become a certain, there's a certain amount of closeness there. But when you stare in the same direction, like an army, Those people always become closer than the people that just stare at each other's eyes. And they have longer lasting friendships. You can, you can look it up sociologically. The army has almost the longest relationships of anyone because those guys are, because they fought together. And when you fight together, you stay loyal together. So let's go on. Our plan is to have groups from three to 30, which is pretty cool, huh? That means if we get to over 30, Richard, we got to multiply. What we're doing, by the way, Richard and ours, is we're going to blow our microchurch up into several groups. You can, you can keep doing yours. I love it. But I just want to let you know, like, we're, we're, we're birthing some babies right now. And the reason why is, is that I've, I want to start a group. I want to grab some younger guys and just invest in them because I love it. And so I love our microchurch. They're all good people, but they're all capable of leading something or helping to lead something. So I'm like, I want to just push them out of the nest a little bit and say, come on, guys, go lead something. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing if this church blew up with like 30 groups? I know of this church and uh, they, had, they had about 5,000 members. They had, uh, I think they had 60 groups in their church, which honestly isn't that impressive for 5,000 members. That's not very many groups. Yeah, it's, if you have five people, that's 300, so they're not even 10%, which is terrible. If they're 10%, they're, yeah, it's, anyway, it's not a lot of people for a th- church of 5,000. So they thought, Our groups are too narrow. We're not offering enough options. They did a similar thing. I didn't get their, this idea from them, but I've just remembered them when I was working on this. They went from 60 groups, listen, to 384 groups in one weekend. You know why? Because people thought, I could do that. I could do a dog walking group. I could do a surf group. I could do this group. I could do that group. How come I'm not doing anything? All I do is come and I sit on Sundays and I listen to the message. I'm, I've got more inside of me than that. And they began to get, the people of God began to get stirred up. And that changed everything because when you have 384 groups, you reach the community. When you have 60, tightly controlled, all the same, it's just the staff and some leaders that run everything. But when you have 384, it can, the staff can't handle it. It's got to be the people. See, this thing needs to become a people movement. Hello? So anyway, um, and then, then here's another thing. We want it to be user-friendly. So go to the next point. The on-ramp is you pick the type of group you want of the five we just showed you. You gather a little team. You do some training. Anybody who decides to do a group, we're going to train you. Now, I say tithe because if you're going to be a leader, you've got to give here. You can't just say, I'm a leader here and not give. This needs to be your house. Don't have three foots and three different doors. Pick a house and go with it. And, uh, and then go, go do it. And the cool thing, if you do the next one, is that there's an off-ramp, which means you serve for six months. If you do a microchurch, we want you to serve for a year because it's a little more investment to establish a pioneer thing. 
But if you do any other kind of group, we start the groups in February and in August, and we also let leaders off the hook. So if they want to do it for six months and either take a break and attend somebody's group or start a new group, they can. Like right now, you guys don't even know this, I'm in a group uh, at Glen Elder's house on Thursdays from 3 to, usually 3 to 5, 3 to 4.30. So I'm in a men's group. It's kind of an amalgamation between a journey group and a passion group and what else? I don't know, it's kind of a, it needs some definition. I'm going to have to talk to Glenn, actually. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, he was in first service. He felt bad. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm joking. You guys all right? All right. But anyway, um, so I'm in his group, but I want to start another group. See, what's, ha- what's cool about that is I can do two groups because I can, if they're, if they're in the late afternoon, it doesn't take, I could do one evening a week and I could do one afternoon a week and I'm good. It's not a big deal, not a big hassle. It's not a big production. I don't have to get the house ready. If I had to get the house ready, it would be one like we're doing now, right? But I can be a part of his because I just go to his front porch and we hang out, which is cool. So I'm going to be in two. I've been in two, actually, because we've had our Guadalupe one and then I have Glenn's one. And it's not because I'm a pastor. It's because I'm a person who believes in this. Like, it's still off hours for me. It's still an evening for our microchurch. And we don't, we don't get paid. None of our staff gets paid to do microchurches. We don't believe in that because we think if we're asking members to do groups, you shouldn't get paid to do a group. So we don't pay our, pa- our staff to do groups. We just say, do it because you're, you believe in Jesus and the vision of the house. Amen. Do it because you're a Christian. Don't do it because you're paid. That's ridiculous. Because if we ask other people with full-time jobs to do it, why should you get paid for it? And we also don't pay our staff to pray. And I'll tell you why. Not because we don't believe in prayer, but because we don't pay anyone else to pray. So we say, have your own devotional life and come to church, come to work revved up on Jesus because you have so much intimacy with him. We're not gonna pay you to spend the first three hours of your day with Jesus, not because we don't believe in it, but because you gotta do what everyone else does. You gotta find a life with Jesus outside your job. Is that the truth? Is that not true? Todd knows, he's pastored churches, he's built ministries, he knows this is true stuff, you guys. So, um, anywho, I've got one more thing, I think. What to do? Join a group, start a group, or add a group to your existing groups. Okay, let me just show you. Before you leave, hold on, unless you've got to leave, do prophetic teams. We're going to give you these cards. The ushers are going to distribute these cards, and they say group response card. What I would love for you to do, you can take it with you, but let me just tell you something. It's easy to make decisions. Some of us are like, I'll pray about it, and then we never make a decision. Just do it. Just do it. The answer is yes, unless God says no. Just do it. I was, I was at uh, Office Max one time. The Lord had said, you're, you're having a difficult time making decisions. And I saw this book called Blink by a guy named Malcolm Gladwell. And he said, I want you to read that book. So I bought it. I started reading it. And you know what it says? It says that emergency room doctors, nurses, firefighters, all these people that have to make split-second decisions, they make decisions almost right almost all the time. This idea that we need to take six months to make a decision is not from heaven. There are certain decisions, yes, you gotta pray for six months. Most decisions, you can make them in a minute, honestly. And this is one of them. You're part of the house, you gotta do a group. If you're not part of the house, do a group and we'll make you part of the house. Seriously, like, let's do this thing. Like, let's blow it up. So anyway, what I'd love for you to do is put your name, cell phone, and then it says, I plan to stay in my current group, just put which one it is. I plan to switch to a different group, put which one it is. By the way, we have eight other groups going right now, but I wanna see us add 12, so we have at least 20. We should have 20 groups right now, easy. So there's room for 12. I wanna start going to a group. By the way, if, there's, if we end up with 30, I'll be happy too. It's not a bad thing. I'm gonna start going to a group, I'm gonna start a new group, or I'm gonna supplement with a second group. So what I'm gonna do is start a new group and then put I'm already going to Glenn's group, but I'm gonna start a new group. My card will say, going to Glenn's and starting a new one. And then just leave it right here. Just right here. We have a, in fact, we have a bucket, I think. First service, I hope first service doesn't outdo you guys. We have so many cards from first service. I can't wait to read them and pray over them. I'm so excited. You guys all right? Yeah. You got awfully quiet all of a sudden. Listen, I can't make you, I'm not trying to make you, but look at this, this is from first service. Amen. Look at that, all these people are gonna do, they're either already doing something or they're gonna do something, but look it. So fill out a card. If you really, really have to, take it home and pray about it, but most of you don't need to pray, you just need to do it. You need to pray, but you need to have a devotional life so you already know what to do because you're listening to the Holy Spirit all the time. Boom. It's called a walk. It's not called a retreat. Walk in the Spirit. 
You learn to walk in the spirit. You learn how to respond in real time because you're listening all the time. That's why it says pray without ceasing. Doesn't mean you shouldn't have special times of prayer, but we gotta live a life of prayer so we can hear God in the real time so we can make decisions so that if an accident happens on the way home, you know what to do because you're listening to the Holy Spirit. So if you're listening to the Holy Spirit, you know what to do. Just trust your gut and do it. Pull the trigger, I dare you. I'm serious. The time of wasting time is over. I know people that have thought about things for a decade. Seriously, that's, a, that's 10 years of your life that have kind of slipped by. Like, let's go. Let's make a difference.